creating the multifaceted martial art we know and love today. Hello everyone, I'm Tim, and today we're going to get to the bottom of the fascinating history and connections between three of the world's most popular martial arts, karate, judo, and taekwondo. Are you ready? Let's go. You know, I've always been fascinated by the early history of the Ryukyu Islands. These islands, now known as Okinawa, were once a bustling hub for trade and cultural exchange between China and Japan. And you know what's amazing? These interactions had a huge impact on the development of martial arts in the region, especially karate. Now let me take you on a little journey through Okinawa, where we'll explore some of the unique styles of karate that emerged there. You see, we've got Shurite, which is all about speed and agility. Nahate, which emphasizes strong stances and powerful strikes. And Tomarite, known for its fluid movements and versatility. These styles are like the grandparents of modern karate. How awesome is that? Meanwhile, over in mainland Japan, martial arts were facing a crisis, with the traditional jiu-jitsu schools in decline during the peaceful Edo period. The need for a new martial arts system was clear. Enter Jigoro Kano, an educator and martial artist with a vision for change. Kano was like a breath of fresh air in the martial arts world. Drawing from his jiu-jitsu training and his experience as an educator, he created judo, a martial art that focused on physical techniques, mental discipline and moral development. In 1882, Kano founded the Kodokan Judo Institute, marking the beginning of modern judo. Let me tell you, his vision was truly revolutionary. A martial art that would be accessible to everyone and contribute to the betterment of society as a whole. Now let's talk about the legendary Gichin Funakoshi, the father of modern karate. Before he introduced karate to Japan, Funakoshi was an educator and a dedicated martial artist in Okinawa. He trained tirelessly, honing his skills and mastering the, the art of karate. You might be wondering, how did Funakoshi and Jigoro Kano, the founder of Judo, end up meeting? Well, the story begins with the first national athletic exhibition in Tokyo, Japan, where Funakoshi was invited to showcase karate. His performance must have been mind-blowing, and it caught the attention of none other than Jigoro Kano himself. When these two martial arts giants met, it was like a meeting of the minds. They exchanged techniques, training methods and even philosophies. It was a melting pot of ideas that shaped the future of both karate and judo. For instance, karate practitioners learned the importance of balance and groundwork from judo, while judo practitioners were inspired by the powerful strikes and fluid movements of karate. This collaboration between Funakoshi and Kano was a game changer, my friends. Their mutual respect and shared vision helped establish karate as a respected and popular martial art in Japan. Karate was no longer just an Okinawan fighting style, it became a symbol of unity and cultural exchange. A bridge, if you will, between Japan and Okinawa that would inspire generations of martial artists to come. Alright, let's explore the story behind the name change from Chinese hand to karate. You see, back then the political climate was a bit tense and national pride was on the rise. Funakoshi and other martial artists wanted to differentiate karate from its Chinese origins, asserting its unique identity as a Japanese martial art. The new name karate, which means empty hand, was more than just a political statement. It held deep philosophical and practical significance. In martial arts, the idea of the empty hand embodies the concept of using one's body as the ultimate weapon. Plus, it reflects the Zen Buddhist principle of emptying the mind of distractions and ego, leading to greater self-awareness and control. Now let's talk about how Judo influenced Karate. For starters, Karate adapted the belt ranking system, which was a brilliant idea from Jigoro Kano. This system not only helped to standardize the training methods, but also created a clear pathway for students to progress in their martial arts journey. But the influence of Judo on Karate went beyond just the technical aspects. It also emphasized the importance of mental discipline and moral development, in line with Kano's vision for Judo. 
This infusion of Judo's principles into karate helped shape it into the martial art that not only developed physical prowess, but also cultivated the mind and spirit. So my friends, the renaming of karate and the influence of Judo not only helped establish karate's identity in Japan, but also enriched its philosophy and training methods, creating the multifaceted martial art we know and love today. Now let's shift our focus to the land of the morning calm, Korea. Before we dive into Taekwondo, let's explore the martial arts scene in Korea, which included native fighting styles like Takyeon and Subak. These traditional styles emphasized fluid rhythmic movements and high acrobatic kicks, which are now hallmarks of Taekwondo. But then things took a turn. From 1910 to 1945, Korea was under Japanese colonization. This period had a profound impact on the evolution of Korean martial arts, as karate techniques and training methods were introduced to the peninsula. Korean martial artists began to blend their native styles with the new techniques, creating the foundations of what became Taekwondo. Unifying various schools and styles under the name Taekwondo was no easy task. Korean martial arts practitioners faced numerous challenges, including uh, different philosophies and techniques. However, the Korean government saw the potential in creating a national martial art and lent its support to the unification effort. With the government's backing, these martial artists worked tirelessly to create a unified martial art that would not only preserve Korea's rich martial arts heritage, but also incorporate the best aspects of karate. And thus, Taekwondo was born a martial art that embodies the spirit of Korea while acknowledging the influence of karate in its development. So who was the mastermind behind this unification of Taekwondo? Let me introduce you to Choi Hong Hee, a man whose background in both karate and Korean martial arts shaped his vision for Taekwondo. As a Korean who trained in karate during the Japanese colonization, Choi understood the need for a martial art that would represent Korea on the world stage. Developing modern Taekwondo was a monumental task. Choi and other dedicated martial artists worked to create new forms known as Pumse that would integrate the best aspects of karate and Korean martial arts. They also emphasized high fast kicks, showcasing the unique acrobatic skills of Korean fighters. You know what really put Taekwondo on the map? Its inclusion in the Olympic Games. This milestone further differentiated Taekwondo from karate and solidified its status as a distinct martial art. With millions of people around the world watching, Taekwondo took center stage, showcasing its powerful techniques and captivating grace. But the story doesn't end there. International organizations such as the World Taekwondo Federation and the International Taekwondo Federation continue to promote and preserve the legacy of Taekwondo. Through their efforts, this amazing martial art continues to thrive, paying homage to its roots in karate while proudly representing the spirit of Korea. And there you have it, my friends. The incredible journey of karate, judo and taekwondo. Three martial arts that have shaped the lives of countless practitioners around the world each with its own unique history and philosophy. They stand a testament to the power of unity, cultural exchange, and the pursuit of excellence. If you like what you see here and you want to see more, click right here to see more. For now, let me wish you a wonderful day, and as always, thanks for watching.